Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us at the uh, GCPD Governor's Committee on uh, People with Disability and Accessibility and our webinar series uh, today. I'd like to focus on accessibility parking in Texas. We've invited a few uh, specialist uh, panelists who are aware with parking uh, accessibility issues with people with disability. We're going to talk about their uh, myriad of information and standards. Uh, legal changes that have taken place and those kinds of support. Before we get going, uh, I want to give you some information. We have a few people ask questions about CEUs and we don't exactly award CEUs for this webinar. However, you can take the email that we send you afterwards and uh, talk with your agency to see if they can accept that uh, as participants for a self-guided study. And also, if you have any questions, you can type those questions in the Q&A because uh, uh, we're going to try to keep everything in, in one place uh, during, the, during the presentation. And, and, try, and we'll have those uh, the panelists answer some of those questions. So, and then if you have any concerns that you want or something that you missed during the presentation, we'll also have a recording that you can view later. All right, well, thank you. I hope you all have a good pr presentation today. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. The goal is to improve opportunities for people with disabilities to enjoy a full, equitable life, uh, live in independent, uh, and, and determine their own, uh, access, their own lives. Uh, the committee also recommends uh, changes with policy and programs for people with disabilities and uh, with various different, different areas and where they live. And the, uh, the committee also supports local and commission on people who uh, have disabilities and we give grants and awards uh, to improve awareness. And soon we're gonna have uh, one in October. We also encourage uh, disability related legal issues. Now we're gonna turn it over to our panelists, uh, Marsha. Thank you. Uh, my name is Marcia Goto. I work with the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, and I've worked there for about 15 years. So we're going to go over some of the accessibility requirements in the Texas Accessibility Standards. Yeah, there it goes. One of the most common questions we get is, how do I make my place, or in this case, uh, parking ADA accessible? While the Texas Accessibility Standards and the Americans with Disabilities Act um, accessibility guidelines are similar, there are some significant differences between the two. Possibly the, uh, the first and possibly the most important difference is that TAS is regulated by Chapter 469 of the State Government Code, and this is a construction law. This requires new construction, renovations, and alterations to a facility, building, or site to trigger accessibility requirements as opposed to the ADA law, which is a regulation of Title I, Title II, and Title III, which are civil rights laws, meaning that everyone that uses the facility have the same rights so that the facility is operational, it must be accessible to all. So when determining if a project needs to be compliant with the Texas Accessibility Standards, our first question we asked was their construction of any kind. Um, this will tell us if the parking provided will need to be accessible with the Texas Accessibility Standards. Now, that was possibly the simplest way to determine if compliance with the Texas Accessibility Standards is needed. But if you're here to learn a little bit more than just if it's required to be accessible, so let's, uh, so then we need to determine what kind of construction you are doing. For example, if a project is new construction of parking facilities, lots, or spaces, uh, that makes sense. Those are required to be accessible and comply with the Texas Accessibility Standards requirements. And we'll talk about those details on how to make that in a few minutes. However, when the construction project is a renovation to an existing facility, there's some additional requirements beyond what is being constructed. A construction project that is an alteration to a primary function area triggers compliance with some things called we call the path of travel elements. I know you just said, what the heck is a path of travel element? Well, let's start with the term um, alteration to a primary function area first. So determining if the construction project is an alteration to a primary function area, you have to determine what is the primary function of the facility itself. 
what is the major activity of the facility is intended for. For example, a courthouse couldn't be a courthouse without courtrooms, or a school couldn't be a school construction project couldn't be a school without classrooms, or you cannot have a parking garage without parking spaces. Conversely, there are some areas in a facility that are not primary function areas. For example, janitor's closets in an office building, break rooms, or boiler rooms. Um, these are all areas that are not necessarily make or break a facility, meaning that if they didn't have those spaces, the building would still function as it's needed. It's important to determine these types of areas um, to determine if construction project is an alteration to a primary function area. Now, remember when I said that new construction has to be made accessible, and the same goes for alterations. The standards explain that if you do an alteration to an existing element, it has to comply with the standards. So if you make an alteration or an addition to a parking lot of the facility, it has to comply. Another example, a, a little less on topic, would be if we chose only to update the one toilet room feeling that the rest of these fixtures are perfectly acceptable, right? The altered toilet room would have to comply with accessibility requirements, but the others would not as they are not being altered, okay? However, TAS takes things a little further in some construction projects. If the project is an alteration affecting a primary function area, remember those areas that the building is intended for, um, the facility has to comply with additional path of travel elements. So for example, it is now an office building and we're adding several offices with doors. That would be a primary function of the office building and trigger compliance with what we call path of travel elements. The whole path of travel element must comply, including all those nasty toilet fixtures we just saw. So there are path what are path of travel elements? They are parking areas, toilet and bathing rooms, telephones, drinking fountains, and the routes connecting those elements to the altered area, including the entrance. The path of travel must be continuous, unobstructed, and fully comply with the Texas Accessibility Standards requirements. Again, for those that like to take screenshots, the path of travel elements are the accessible route to the parking, restrooms, telephones, and drinking fountains. These elements must comply with the Texas Accessibility Standards when the construction project is an alteration that affects the usability of a primary function area. Now, having said, there are two situations where there may be exceptions. The first is if the construction project is fully funded by the tenant. So we have large complexes that have tenants within them. If it is fully fun funded by them, there is an exception. So what we mean by fully funded means that it is, is completely funded by the tenant, meaning the owner is not reimbursing of any kind. And then the path of travel elements outside that tenant space would not be required to comply, uh, be updated to comply with text accessibility standards. Okay, that includes the parking. So to rephrase that, um, the alterations by a tenant in areas that only the tenant occupies do not trigger path of travel obligations, including the parking, that fall under the landlord's authority should the construction project be funded by the tenant. Landlord authority means that the path of travel elements outside the tenant space. So for example, we have a strip center here. Um, there, the tenant is working on an interior construction project and paying for it themselves. The path of travel elements outside the tenant space, so those restrooms, the route, and the parking, um, would have, sorry, outside the tenant space would not have to uh, comply with the Texas accessibility standards for this, construct this particular construction project. That doesn't mean that the owner gets a free pass. Um, those elements, including the parking, still have to comply every time the owner does any other construction work for them to specifically, or if other construction projects that are not strictly tenant funded. So for this tenant funded project, we would not have to make those particular outside elements accessible at the time of construction.
This also does not exempt the path of travel elements within the tenant space, um, including restrooms that are located or telephones or drinking fountains. Um, in addition, should the tenant renovation be a tenant that is for the whole building, the exterior path of travel elements, including the parking, are considered to be tenant jurisdiction and would have to comply with the requirements that we will talk about here shortly. So they would have to comply with all of those. Now, remember the landlord remains ultimately responsible to the department for compliance, regardless of the tenant exception being applied. And they do not get away with the ADA requirements that are civil rights laws, right? All right, the next path of travel ex exception for parking is the project complies with safe harbor. This is the closest thing you're gonna get to accessibility requirements to what's commonly referred to as grandfather clause. We hear that one a lot. Uh, because when it comes to building accessibility, there's really no such thing as being grandfathered. Safe Harbor is in reference to path of travel elements that previously complied with a previous edition of the Texas Accessibility Standards. For Texans, that means if the path of travel elements, parking, toilet room, telephones, drinking fountains, and all those that we just talked about, complied with the 1994 Texas Accessibility Standards, they do not have to be updated to meet the 2012 Texas Accessibility Standards requirements. I'll repeat that. The path of travel elements that were previously constructed and complied with the 1994 Texas Accessibility Standards and are not being altered, because remember, if you alter an element, you must comply, then they can remain. So for example, the office building that did the office alteration we were talking about before, if parking, if the parking complied with 1994 Texas Accessibility Standards in full, it would not have to be updated to comply with the 2012 Texas Accessibility Standards. I want to add that if previous construction project applied for a variance for say the slope of your accessible parking and was allowed per TDLR, then it didn't comply in full with the 1994 standards and it, safe harbor would not be applied. Again, safe harbor does not mean that the project path of travel elements don't have to comply ever, just until the next construction project that makes an alteration. So those particular elements would, if it never complied with the 94 standards, it does not meet safe harbor. Okay, so now when you, uh, we know when you have to make an accessible parking comply, but how to make it accessible. So let's talk about that. There are many kinds of parking out there. If somebody has a pregnant mom parking, veteran parking, on-street parking, um, and contractor parking, they have to have accessible spots in each kind. If you keep your eyes open, you can see some weird stuff all over. All of these types of parking lots are considered parking facilities. Each of them then provides accessible parking spaces. There are some less common vehicle parking that you may not realize is required to be accessible. Valet parking is a special case in that uh, the parking facilities where the vehicles are stored must be providing accessible parking because not all accessible vehicles can be driven by valets. In addition, they have to provide passenger loading zones that comply with the standards as well. Something else that may not be commonly known is that if you provide ride share dedicated area, um, it would be considered passenger loading areas and need to comply with those requirements as well. Um, next one that may be coming up more often now are electrical vehicle charging spaces. These are not considered parking spaces. They are actually considered fuel dispensers. Sorry. Um, therefore, they don't have to meet parking requirements of the Texas Accessibility Standards. They have to meet operable parts and must be on an accessible route, but are not required to be provided anything further at this time. However, that may change soon as TDLR and the feds are working to start ensuring accessibility for these types of elements. Okay, that was a lot of information, but main point is if you provide parking facilities, you must provide accessible parking. Of course, there's a few exceptions. 
Um, if a parking facility is for delivery of vehicles, uh, parking and has provided a compliant public loading zone, accessible parking would not be required for that parking facility. Here's an example of uh, what appears to be a parking facility that is for law enforcement vehicles. But if you look at the lot, it appears not to be limited to just law enforcement vehicles, unless that's an unmarked car. Hmm. This one may not qualify for the exception, actually. Not working. Click. Come on. Thanks. Um, now, when looking at parking facilities, the number of total parking spaces provide us tell us how many accessible parking spaces must be provided. The accessible parking space is determined in facility by facility basis. For example, in this image, you can see a surface lot and a parking garage. These would be considered two different parking facilities. In this photo, you could see two distinct parking lots. Um, the garage and the surface parking lot. If you count the spaces of both parking lots together, you'll get the wrong number of accessible spaces. For these kind of facilities, you're actually going to go to uh, table 208.2 in the Texas Accessibility Standards. Um, and that'll give you the number of required accessible spaces based on the total parking spaces provided per each facility. When that number goes over 500, the calculation goes to 2% of the total. In addition uh, to the standard accessible parking spaces, there is a requirement to also provide a certain number of van accessible parking spaces. Van accessible parking spaces allow for bigger vehicles. For every six or fraction of six accessible parking spaces, you have to provide a minimum of one van accessible parking space. So if you have a surface lot that had 325 parking spaces, according to table 208.2, that requires eight accessible parking spaces to be provided. And of those eight, two of those have to be van accessible. Lots of math. <laughs> Where there are four facility, there are, sorry, there are four different types of facilities also listed that have their own requirements for minimum number of accessible parking spaces. These are typically to accommodate for medical facilities that have a greater need for accessible parking. Hospital outpatient facilities serve reserve 10% of the patient and visitor parking for accessible parking. Out of that 10%, every six or fraction of six spots will be van accessible. And this does not include parking spaces reserved for hospital staff and doctors. Those are parking facilities that have to use table 208.2. Um, so what we mean when we say outpatient facilities, these are facilities located in hospitals that do not need overnight stays. So logically, these patients are doing procedures and leaving and need larger accessible spaces to maneuver into their vehicles. The second facility that has a large need for accessible parking spaces would be rehabilitation and physical therapy facilities located on, focused on treating conditions that affect mobility and outpatient physical therapy. Parking provided for these types of facilities gets 20% accessible parking spaces because many of the patients are temporary or permanently disabled. Here's just a few of the conditions that affect mobility. When we see somebody out, get out of a vehicle with a disabled space and they don't look disabled, we may wonder if they should be in that spot or feel if they're getting away with something. There, there's a wide range of disabilities that do not require um, the don't require mobility aids. Uh, we see a, a lot more of these now with COVID and having respiratory issues. Lastly, there are three residential facilities required to provide accessible parking spaces beyond table 208.2's minimum number. Social service establishments, um, examples would be group homes, halfway houses, and women's shelters emergency response facilities with overnight accommodations and graduate student and faculty housing uh, at places of education. It's important to note that the Texas Accessibility Standards do not cover parking at uh, that is for apartments, condos, or single family residents. Those are actually exempted from the standards per rule 6830 number four. But you can contact your, fair your local fair housing office for more information on federal requirements for those types of facilities. 
But if you have one of the subject facilities, the social service establishment, the emergency response or graduate uh, or faculty housing, at least one parking space for each mobility feature dwelling unit must be provided. Uh oh, went too far. Sorry. Um, if, in addition to those accessible parking spaces must be located on the shortest accessible route to that dwelling unit. Um, speaking of accessible parking locations, going back to the majority of parking facilities, the accessible parking spaces must be on the shortest possible accessible route to the entrance that they serve. Remember, our path of travel requirements include an accessible route to the altered area, so the shortest accessible route to that particular entrance. If a parking facility is not serving a particular building, like that of a parking garage downtown, the accessible parking has to be to the closest pedestrian uh, entrance of that parking facility. So here we have two accessible spaces that are installed on the sh shortest accessible route to three facilities. There's one ramp and it's right in the middle of the, the stories. However, should there be multiple entrances at the accessible parking serve uh, must be dispersed. There is an exception, of course, to the location uh, for van accessible parking spaces disper uh, dispersion, allowing them to be located on one level of a multi-story parking facility. And another exception on location, you're allowed to move, so, uh, if you have several different parking facilities within one site, the standards allow you to move your accessible parking spaces to be grouped onto one uh, lot or facility as long as it's equivalent or greater accessibility, meaning distance to the entrance, parking fee is coverage. You can't charge an accessible parking space, a parking fee to the closer lot if the further lot is not charging fees. Now to the dirt of what accessible parking spaces look like. Um, a standard parking space is eight foot wide with a five foot wide access aisle. That's the same depth as the parking space itself. The van accessible parking space is 11 foot wide with a five foot wide access aisle totaling 16 feet wide for the two. The standards do allow an exception um, that allows for the van accessible space to be eight foot wide with an eight foot wide access aisle. It still equals out to a total of 16 feet. The parking space and associated access aisle must be level, meaning no more than 2% slope in any direction and must be a full width and length of both the parking spaces and associated access aisles. The associated access aisle must be on the same level as parking spaces and cannot overlap vehicular way. Um, this is especially important when you're looking at on-street parking. Angled van accessible parking must, be, uh, must have an access aisle on the passenger side of the vehicle. Non-angled parking spaces may have the access aisle on either side. Um, the Texas Accessibility Standards require that the access aisle be marked to deter parking within the access aisle and connect to an accessible route. So speaking of the accessible route, the accessible parking spaces must be designed to prevent the vehicle that is parked in them from reducing the required accessible route clear width to less than 36 inches. Wheel stops are not necessarily a cure-all when this, uh, but when this comes to really big cars and trucks, but they can be helpful. Vertical height requirements of the accessible parking are that of 98 inches minimum, and that accommodates the need of several of the taller accessible vehicles. Now, the Texas Accessibility Standards require an accessible parking space to be identified with the international symbol of accessibility. That is this particular icon. Um, the others are not technically allowed to be used based on the standards themselves. So if you've seen the faster um, speedy wheelchair guy, or I've even went to uh, Roswell and saw an alien in a wheelchair once, those don't comply. Um, in addition, the, the parking spaces that are van accessible spaces, those have to be indicated as well. That sign has to be located that the bottom surface is a minimum of 60 inches above the parking ground surface and the van accessible sign required should be located under that. 
Now notice I said 60 inches above the parking surface. It should, so should you have a signage located behind a curb like this one, measurement should be taken from the ground surface of the parking itself, um, not from where the ground surface of the sign is located. And then there's one last exception. Should your parking facilities have four or fewer parking spaces, the identification signage, um, the, the international symbol of accessibility just mentioned, this uh, does not have to be provided. It doesn't exempt the requirement of providing accessible parking spaces or associated access aisles, just the signage itself. Now, there were some accessibility, those were the accessibility of parking requirements of the Texas Accessibility Standards. Let's go over the require, additional requirements that are part of the Texas Administrative Rule Chapter 68 um, that are in addition to the Texas Accessibility Standards. It's important to note that these requirements do not qualify for safe harbor because they are included in path, but are included in path of travel requirements. The way the standards are written right now, the path of travel includes accessible parking requirements like this one, but the safe harbor is defined as meeting requirements of the 1994 Texas Accessibility Standards. Since those parking, the parking requirements in the rule are not part of those 1994 standards, they don't qualify. So that at a minimum, three require these three requirements that we're about to talk about will should be added to every alteration project as a primary function project. It went too far. First is that these requirements only apply to paved parking. Um, they should should you have a gravel or grass parking facilities, these requirements would not apply. Chapter 68-1041 requires an additional international symbol of accessibility to be painted with a contrasting color within your accessible parking spaces. Requirement number two says that the words no parking must be painted in the associated access aisle. The letters must be all capital letters with a height of 12 inches, stroke of two inches minimum, and centered on the aisle. This doesn't distinguish the direction or state that the lettering cannot be angled along those common access aisle lines. And the number three is it requires an additional signage specifying consequences of parking within the accessible parking spaces without proper authority. The sign must be a minimum, at a minimum has to state violators subject to fine and towing and must be mounted with the accessible parking signage required um, per the standards. So, but lo no lower than eight inches below. So they're located between 48 and 80 inches above the parking surface. Okay, I do have my information there in case anybody has questions. So we will um, turn it over to the next presenter. Also remember that uh, you will want to uh, put your questions in the Q&A uh, so people can uh, answer those in there. So uh, Chase, if you'll take it away. All right. Well, trying to, hang on one second. It's not letting me advance them now. Matthew, are you able to advance it for me and I just tell you? All right. First, my name is Chase Beard and thank you all for having us in March. And thank you for that overview. Uh, a big part of why we're here is to talk about enforcement and of uh, SB 904 that passed in the 88th legislature. Um, my work has been at the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities. We're a statewide disability advocacy organization. Um, and parking is one of the major issues we get calls on from across the state. Uh, myself, I am a C56 quadriplegic. I broke my neck at 17 and became paralyzed from the neck down, regained some use of my arms, and uh, I do use accessible parking every day. And it's vital to my ability to be able to work and, and live and do the things I need to do. Um, I think we have to take one second to really understand what accessible parking is for those of you that might be attending from a county or a city um, and don't know anyone who actually really depends on these spaces. For many in our community, it's not just 
getting close enough to get into a building. It's actually a health and safety issue, um, especially during this heat, a great example. Uh, myself, I'm, since I'm a quadriplegic, my injury level, it created a part of my disability to where I cannot sweat at all. And this is pretty common for a lot of people with different disabilities or on different medications. You add that into today's heat that we're having in this state, and a person can quickly end up in a very serious situation. And what most people don't think about is when you park in that accessible space, those crosshatch marks are so vital. And if you cannot open your door all the way to get in and out of your vehicle or lower your ramp to get your power chair up the ramp because there's a motorcycle parked there or someone squeezed in there where the supposed to say no parking, um, you can effectively put someone in a very serious life-threatening situation. And I know most people never probably think of that, but that is one of the major reasons why we've worked with other groups to try and make sure we are enforcing the state's laws around accessible parking and where we see a lot of abuse happening. Um, for many people, you, you may say, well, I see a bunch of those spots open all the time. It's kind of like on demand. You know, I-35, major interstate, there's probably plenty of space on it at, you know, five in the morning, but at five in the afternoon, it is very intense and trying to find a way to get around is very difficult. So with that being said, you know, take this really seriously within your communities and understanding why the disability community is really pushing to see more enforcement around accessible parking. Uh, for the longest time, many of the tickets that were uh, issued were dismissed and it took many of our volunteer groups and I myself work with parking mobility here in Travis County and Hayes uh, to start getting data in and collected to be able to see how many were being dismissed and what issues were, were being caused. Once originally in 2019, now let's get go back to why the recent bill had to be passed. Then Representative Springer had filed a, a bill that would improve the, the requirements of things needed with accessible parking. And you know, the first thing being that it had to have the no parking sign uh, painted on the ground in the middle of the um, access aisles. The sign had to also show what the fine levels were um, and a few other having that, that contrasting color. So, what ended up happening and something that we had brought to attention during, during the session and that we were afraid might happen is that most judges and counties and cities, when a ticket is issued, would have no idea which standard that accessible parking space was under because a judge doesn't know, is this a new building or is this an old building? And where is that parking space? So they started dismissing. And the reason we found out is that we're able to collect data off of all of our volunteers through an app that is used that really starts to give you a snapshot of what's going on. And when you start seeing high dismissals from one area, it allows you to then speak with, with judges in, in those areas and figure out why. And it's exactly what we had expected is that they could not tell which standard it needed to go under, the old standard or the newest standard. Uh, so they just started dismissing blindly. Um, what we did was then come back to now Senator Springer this last legislative session, and we asked him if they could work on coming up with a minimum standard for enforcement. It's something that's used in other states. Um, it did not reduce what has to be done on new buildings. What it did is it requires, you know, all new buildings to be built to the newest standard and have all of the, the no parking in, in the crosshatch, the sign of course and everything. But it actually created a lower bar for enforcement. And, and that being said, um, under 3163, when they added those things, we needed to backtrack because we didn't know how to address the, the enforcement issue if people started rejecting them. 
So once 904 was submitted and it, and it passed out of the House and Senate and was signed by the governor, we got questions uh, starting that kind of hit. Let's let's go to the next slide. All right, here we go. And actually, you know, I'll read the intent really quickly. Um, SB 904 amends HB 3163 from the 86, um, the requirements for how accessible parking spaces are designated. Uh, however, TDLR inspects new buildings for compliance, thereby putting thousands of clearly marked accessible spaces under the old system, uh, which are waiting to be updated or out of compliance. So we basically made all those spaces unenforceable. As a result, local law enforcement no longer ticket those vehicles and spaces intended for people with disabilities. And we all know what happens when you don't enforce a law, people won't follow it anymore. Uh, some judges had stopped and by enacting a minimal enforcement standard that allows for both the old and new standards, the state can protect those spots. So that was the reason for SB 904. And if you go to the next slide, So, you know, the big question we got, um, and that was sent and emailed early on, was if the parking space or area is generally in compliance with the standards um, that are specified clearly, what, what does that really mean? How do you know what is considered minimal um, in, that, in that area? So if you go to the next slide, I can show you some pictures. All right, so unfortunately, this is our building. Our sign was stolen uh, a while back from our accessible parking space. And then the next sad thing was the striping company we hired a couple of years ago used a very inferior paint and it has completely disintegrated this year in this heat. Um, so we're in the process of actually getting that restriped uh, very soon. Uh, we ended up having to put in a new accessible parking sign so right now under the old standards which came from 2019 the photo on the left would of course not be in compliance and you could not enforce it now on the right the main thing people have to look for now when it comes to is this an enforceable parking space is the sign if the sign is there and it's reasonably a person would any reasonable person would realize that that is considered an accessible parking space, then it can be enforced, even if it doesn't have the no parking in the cross aisles. Um, because we just can't figure out, judges are never gonna know, TDLR isn't gonna be able to supply them which spaces are under the newest recommend or newest code and what's under the old. So that's one good example. If the sign is there, then it's enforceable. Now, if you go to the next page. So here's two good examples of just around our neighborhood. And this is one of the biggest problems we see is it's not just people who are abusing accessible parking spaces, but when tenants or even cities and counties don't maintain those parking spaces, as you can see, that is completely, everyone would know that's an accessible parking space under the standards. The problem is it's missing the sign. So neither of those can actually be enforced. Um, that's one of our biggest problems right now. And something cities, counties, TDLR, and all of us need to work on is finding a mechanism that allows us to report to TDLR and a mechanism that sends out a letter or something easy to the building owners that asks them to come back into compliance. So that way that space can be enforced and can be um, under the current program. Otherwise we are not doing our jobs as state, uh, county or you know, advocates to protect and allow enforcement in this area. I know it's kind of confusing, but the main thing that we want to see is good enforcement. We've already been working on it and finding a way to quickly track and automate where these kinds of spots are. And we would love to work with TDLR and any other of the 
volunteer groups to uh, show how we can do it to help. But all in all, we have to have enforcement of these spaces. We have to have them up and compliant. Otherwise, we are really just deserving a, a large population of people who may need those spaces. And I always do remind people is that if you don't right now, at some point in your life, you probably will or a family member will. Um, so please take this serious. Go back to your, your cities and your counties and let them know how important it is to maintain and continue enforcing. And if you run across spaces like this and have to dismiss them, take action. Reach out to the, to the building owner. I know it takes extra time. But we all have have to do the right thing and, and make sure we bring as many of these spaces that are out of compliance and unable to be enforced back into code. Um, that is the, the crux of why we push to get that minimal enforcement standard. It doesn't mean, you know, currently right now, a police officer could write a warning for that, at least. In the past, many wouldn't because they know that it wouldn't go through to be dismissed. I think it is important for people to, to at least get a warning if they don't have a placard or a plate and they're parking in a space like that. Once the sign's in place, then I think full enforcement um, should be made in that position. If y'all have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, my information is here. We're more than happy to talk um, and we'd love to help solve any parking issues and uh, help with uh, making sure you bring up your cities and counties. Thank y'all. Okay, Stefan, take it away. All right, good morning. My name is Stefan Krish. Let's work on this slide here. There we go. My name is Stephen Chris. I'm the Director of Registration Services with the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles. Thank you for allowing me to speak with y'all today regarding the application process for parking placards and license plates for persons with disabilities. Parking placards are available for issuance to a person with either a temporary or permanent disability. The placards are designed to hang from the vehicle's rear view mirror when the vehicle is parked in a disabled parking space. The vehicle does not have a rear view mirror. Display the placard on the center portion of the dashboard in a manner that is clearly visible through the windshield. When a disabled parking placard is placed on the rear view mirror of a vehicle transporting a person with a disability, the vehicle operator is afforded the same parking privileges as the operator of a vehicle displaying a disabled person license plate. Both disabled placards have an expiration date area that is at least three inches in height and a month and year hole punch system expiration date. Information written on the placard includes the county number, first four digits of the driver's license, identification card or military ID, and the initials of the applicant. Red disabled placards are issued to a person with a temporary disability or to a person with a permanent disability that is an out of state or out of country resident and seeking medical treatment in Texas. Blue disabled parking placards are issued to a person with a permanent disability. Disabled person license plates include the international symbol of access and are only issued to those with a permanent disability. The international symbol of access is required to be displayed on the license plate, including disabled veteran license plates to be authorized to park in a designated parking space. Placard and plate eligibility is based on medical condition that meets the legal definition of disability. Disability means a condition in which a person has visual acuity of 2200 or less in the better eye with correcting lenses, visual acuity of more than 2200, but with limited field of vision in which the widest diameter of the visual field uh, subtends an angle of 20 degrees or less, mobility problems that substantially impair a person's ability to move around, uh, potentially caused by paralysis, lung disease, cardiac deficiency, wheelchair confinement, arthritis, foot disorder, or any other medical condition uh, causing a person to use a brace cane, crutch, or other assistive device. Please note, 
uh, a parking placard or plate is only valid when being used by the person with the disability or someone who is driving the person with the disability. Just because you have the plate, if you are not the person that is disabled, you are not entitled to use that parking space. Um, it is a violation of the law in, in that regard. Um, it, it is also unsafe uh, to operate the motor vehicle on a public roadway with the disabled placard hanging from the rearview mirror. Please only put that placard on the mirror when you're parking and, and don't drive around with it. It is a distraction when you're driving. Application for disabled person license plates must be submitted through the county tax assessor collector's office in the county in which the applicant resides. Application for disabled parking placards must be submitted through the county tax assessor collector's office in the county in which the applicant resides or in the county in which the applicant is seeking medical treatment. For out of state or out of country residents, the application for disabled parking placards must be submitted through the county tax assessor collector's office in which the applicant is seeking medical treatment. The applicant may be the owner of a registered vehicle that is regularly operated by or for the transportation of a disabled person or a disabled person who is not a vehicle owner. Application for disabled parking placards and disabled person license plates may be made by submitting the application for persons with disabilities parking placard and or license plate our form VTR 214, which is available on our website. The disabled person or person making application on behalf of the disabled person must include their driver's license number or identification card number issued by the Texas Department of Public Safety. Out of state driver license or identification is allowed for non-residents who have a Texas address such as a winter Texan those seeking treatment in Texas and non-resident military personnel or the spouse and military personnel stationed on a military installation in Texas. Initial application for a disabled person license plate or placard must provide for proof of disability. The disability statement on the form 214 must be signed by a physician, physician's assistant, advanced practice nurse or advanced nurse practitioner licensed to practice medicine in Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, or Oklahoma, or a physician practicing medicine in a hospital or other health facility of the U.S. military or U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. The licensed medical professional signature must be notarized on the form 214 unless a separate original prescription, electronic or paper, uh, is submitted in lieu of the notarized signature. The prescription should include the disabled person's name, type of disability, whether permanent or temporary, the licensed medical professional's title as defined above, or as I previously disclosed, and their signature. Blue disabled placards, which are the permanent ones, are valid for a maximum of four years. Red disabled placards, the temporary ones, are valid only for six months from the date of issuance or until the end of the disability, whichever comes first and as disclosed by the medical practitioner. Red disabled placards for out of state or country residents with the permanent disability seeking medical treatment in Texas are valid for six months from the date of issuance or until the end of the disability, whichever comes first. If you have a temporary placard that expires, you will need to apply for a new placard if you're, when your temporary disability extends beyond the six month limit. To renew a blue placard, a permanent placard, uh, you would download our form, VTR 214 again, complete all sections on page one, the front of the new app, and, but you're not required to complete the disability statement, the doctor statement on page two. Uh, submit a copy of the original application along with your the new application to the county tax office. If you don't have a copy of your original application, uh, you can also submit your expired placard to the county office and they will accept that. Um, so a key point here is once you submit that original application, make sure you keep a copy of that. That will come in very handy in the future when you need to renew. It'll save you the hassle of having to go back to your doctor and get that statement uh, recompleted. Um, a new VTR 214 is not required when renewing disabled person license plates.
So as of January 1st, 2022, anyone parking in a disabled parking space must have a disabled person license plate or a disabled parking placard that features the international symbol of access. Disabled veteran license plates do not feature the ISA unless it's specifically requested. Uh, Texans with disabled veteran license plates wishing to use a disabled parking space must apply for a disabled parking placard or for a new disabled veteran license plate that features the international symbol of access. The veteran must meet the eligibility requirements uh, for a disabled parking placard or for the license plate featuring the ISA. Please, please be aware that not all disabilities that qualify for a disabled veteran license plate will automatically qualify you for the international symbol of access plate you have to meet those same mobility impairments or visual impairments that I discussed early on in the presentation. Um, for a disabled parking placard, the procedure is the same uh, as a not, you know, someone who's not a, a veteran. For a disabled veteran license plate with an ISA, you would download a different form, uh, which is the application for disabled veteran license plates or pl parking placard, which is a VTR 615. Um, Either form, you will have your healthcare practitioner complete the notarized section, uh, disability certification statement, and or provide the prescription, just like I disclosed in the previous slide. Um, and then you would, just like before, you would submit this to your county tax assessor collector. Currently issued, if you happen to have a disabled parking placard that came with your disabled veteran plates that is still valid, that will remain valid until time of renewal. At time of renewal, you will be required to meet those new requirements where you would have to provide the medical certification. A Little bit of additional information here. Uh, if you happen to be visiting Texas from another state or country, uh, we do offer reciprocity. Uh, so your valid disabled parking placard and plates will be honored providing that that placard or plate is valid. Um, but keep in mind, you have to abide by Texas parking laws, not the parking laws of your home state or country. Uh, if the purpose of your visit is to seek medical treatment in Texas, you have a permanent disability, keep in mind you can apply for a Texas temporary parking placard. Uh, if your placard is lost or stolen, um, you can replace it by presenting a copy of that VTR 214, hence good reason to keep a copy of it always, uh, that you originally submitted to your local county tax assessor collector's office. Uh, if you don't have a copy of the form um, and the county can't verify, they don't have a copy on file. Uh, and I'll tell you, the smaller counties are really good about you know, keeping access uh, of those copies, but the larger counties, it just isn't possible. It's not feasible. So, um, please keep a copy of that original form uh, because if you don't have it and they can't verify it, you will have to reapply, which includes a new medical certification. Uh, also keep in mind that a law enforcement officer may seize a disabled parking placard that the officer believes is being used illegally. Uh, if your placard is seized by law enforcement and you would like a new one, you will be required to apply as though it was an initial application, meaning a new medical certification and a completely new form. Um, finally, just, I, just one more time, want to reiterate that vehicles with a disabled parking placard or license plate displaying the ISA, only displaying the ISA, uh, are allowed to park in a designated spot for persons with disabilities. And they could be also with the park, the placard or the plate can be uh, exempt from local and state government parking meters. You do not receive any benefits for federal parking. Uh, state law does not allow you to exceed the meter limit, but certain city ordinances do allow for that. So check for with your local jurisdiction. Finally, I would encourage everyone to visit our website, www.txdmv.gov forward slash motorists forward slash disabled dash parking dash placards dash plates uh, to get additional information 
or to download the forms prior to visiting the county tax office. It'll save you some hassle there having to fill it out at the county. Uh, I would also suggest that you download and review the resources that I've displayed here. We've got a, a, a brochure that covers basic facts for persons with disabilities. We have a brochure that details the various disabled veterans license plates. And we have a brochure that uh, speaks to the special plates uh, for disabled veterans. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. We have five minutes left. I hope we have enough time to be able to talk about uh, the uh, volunteer. So we have uh, Milani Curry, you'll take it away. Good morning, I'm Melanie Curry. I'm with uh, the city of Houston, uh, Park Houston. We are the um, on-street parking management division for the, for the city. And um, I'm here to share information about how to start a volunteer program. Um, volunteers, are very vital in our efforts in keeping Houston accessible. In uh, 2021, there was a study done. It said that 23% of the adults in America are, are volunteers. And that leads to almost a $1.2 billion uh, impact. So volunteers not only have an impact in accessibility, but all across our country. They allow people to fulfill a personal passion. And our volunteers have a passion to protect the rights of the disabled community. Many is because they are transporting a loved one who has a need for that parking space. Chase shared earlier the importance of those parking spaces. Many view them as convenient, curbside, close parking spaces. But no, those are vital for people with disabilities to work, live, and play. Uh, next slide. Um, now, the, uh, the state, Texas state st statute 681.0101 allows uh, government entities to establish a volunteer program. Um, you have to provide the, your participants a four hour training. You want them to know, understand the regulations. Um, it's important that they understand how to handle conflict because you know nobody's not happy with receiving a parking citation, they're going to encounter conflict. Um, but remind them as an extension of your agency, they are also public servants. So they have to treat the public with, res with respect. And, and above all things, always put their personal safety first. All volunteers are required to be recertified every three years. And it's important during that recertification program that you talk with your volunteers about their experience so you can improve your process. And also they are very important recruiters for your program in the future. Next slide, please. There we go. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, one of the first things you wanna educate your volunteers on is what is a, a valid parking space that can be enforceable. Uh, Chase has talked about how his, his organization did the work to make sure that uh, these parking spaces are, are enforceable. And the, the main requirement for an enforceable par parking space is that it has that ADA uh, sign in the front of, of the parking space, directly in front of that parking space. And that, that sign must have the international symbol of access. The other ADA requirements are, are not required for enforcement of a parking citation, but you must have that sign. We um, provide our volunteers with this handout. So if they see someone who has a valid placard and they've parked in the access aisle, we wanna educate them, let them know that this is a no parking zone because we don't wanna punish people who have the right to use those spaces. We wanna educate them and make sure they know the proper way to use the ADA parking space. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, and then as um, Stefan just discussed, the, the all anyone using an ADA parking space must have a license plate with the international symbol of access or the, the wheelchair emblem. And that includes disabled veterans now. Um, valid placards 
They're going to have that information from the county filled out. They're going to have that text dot sticker. They're going to have the date punched and the date written, and those must coincide. And the, of course, a blue placard is valid for four years. A red placard is valid for six months. And a very good way that you can identify fake or fraudulent placards, they usually tend to get the expiration dates wrong, especially on the red placards. They'll buy them off of Facebook or so, some type of social media outlet, and they'll make a red placard valid for three or four years. And that's just a red flag to know that that's not a valid placard. So that's something you include in your training when you're preparing your volunteers to go out and, and patrol. And uh, they, they uh, shared earlier about the requirements for now for disabled veterans. Many agencies have developed flyers such as this to help educate the, the disabled veterans about the change in the, the regulations because many of them, they, they, have, they haven't applied for the, the correct credentials. They have the license plate with the international symbol of access or to get their parking placard. So this lets them know what, what, what they're going to need. We partnered with our Department of Veterans Affairs to, to spread the word. And also we give our volunteers these type of handouts, helps them dis, dis escalate some, some tense situations. And it also gets the word out in the, in the community that the veterans now have this requirement to use, to legally park in ADA parking spaces. Now, as you, after you educate and empower your volunteers, you have to equip them to patrol. The most important piece of equipment is that they have some type of identification showing that they're official representative for your agency. It, um, of course, an, an ID card with their, with their name, your, the name of your agency, and uh, how to contact your agency if there's any type of dispute out in the field. We also provide um, safety vests and caps, not necessarily a full uniform, but if, if your agency decides to do so, that may be something that you could also do. You're gonna give, either maybe give them handheld uh, devices or citation books so they can issue the citations. But it, you must emphasize that they must keep those very secure and that they are the only ones authorized to use that equipment. And this is another time when they should all, always practice social distancing, not for the sake of um, worrying about the virus, but you do not want to be close enough to someone to where they can snatch that equipment out of your hand. We've had that happen to a couple of volunteers, but fortunately we had pictures of the person's vehicle and their license plate number. So we were able to track them down and it didn't end well for them at, at, in, in the long run. But you know, teach your volunteers to keep their distance so that no one can uh, come in and just snatch their equipment out of their hand. And you as the administrator of the program, you must be prepared to take all the heat. Uh, from my experience, I've been doing uh, parkings for 16 years. No one likes a parking citation. They especially do not like a parking citation that's gonna cost between 500 to $1,300, depending where you're at in Texas. So you need to be prepared to accept all that heat with, that your volunteers are going to encounter out in the field. So make sure they have quick access to your contact information. Put your contact information on the back of your citations. Uh, give them your business card or have your contact inf information on the back of their ID so that you can deal with the disgruntled people out in the field. And you can show them how they can resolve or how they can even dispute the citation. People make, make mistakes, they might've forgot their placard. And so you, you can give them the, all the information they need and your volunteer can separate themselves from that situation and, and go on and not feel threatened or uncomfortable due to the, the, the heat that's coming on at that moment. Now it's important that you wanna train advocates and not avengers. Some people get a false sense of security, a false sense of superiority when you give them that badge and when you give them that ticket book. And they, they, they're looking to punish people, they become power hungry and they just wanna penalize and inflict pain. But we want people who are passionate about supporting the parking rights of the disabled community. So we want advocates. 
These are people who are working on a, a passion to fill a need. They have a loved one who needs those parking spaces, or they know the importance of those parking spaces for people to work, live, and play. They have a desire to serve their community. They want to increase accessibility in their community. They are not looking to fulfill some type of dream of being a, 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 a cop or being um, the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. They, they, they want it, their, their passion is to protect the needs of the disabled community. So always emphasizing in your trainings that you're not, you're not being trained to be the heavy hand of the law. You are trained to be an advocate and a support for members of the disabled community. And after, after you've done your training, you have your volunteers out in the field, you wanna take the time to evaluate. How many people have you trained? How many of those people that you trained, how many are still active? How many are returning for recertification? If someone's not returning for recertification, reach out to them and find out why. Find out why they've made the choice to become inactive. Or if you've had someone who's been very active for a while and all of a sudden you're not hearing from them, take the time to reach out. Maybe they're having a personal crisis in, in their life and you can offer them, them some support because of the support that they've offered you throughout the program. Because you think most of our agencies, our enforcement officers are focused on the um, public right of way. So I know in Houston, having volunteers who could address the parking violations on the private properties and shopping centers at grocery stores, at, at hospitals, it, it's, it's a very important in our efforts to keep Houston accessible. We've had years where volunteers issue, issue over 80% of the citations for people illegally parking in disabled parking spaces. So they have a significant impact in, in keeping Houston accessible. And of course, you want to take the time to celebrate and congratulate them and recognize them. Um, we have uh, a luncheon in the summertime and we try to have a little holiday celebration just to let them know just something simple, but just to let them know how important and how vital and the impact they're having. We share statistics about citations that have been dismissed, the number of citations that may have been dismissed due to an error or the number the percentage of citations they've issued compared to our officers and police officers combined, let them know their, their impact. We don't focus on the number of citations that each volunteer has issued because we're not trying to create avengers. We're focusing on their advocacy, on protecting the parking rights of the disabled community. Well, I hope I was able to condense it in five minutes, <laughs> five minutes, but if you have any additional questions, Here's well, that, that, thank you so much. <laughs> We're going to wrap it up. If, if you want to stay and talk, okay. uh, have some more questions, we can uh, stop the recording and we have a few minutes too. But thank you for your coming and I hope you learn more about accessibility parking. Thank you so much. Take care. Goodbye.